We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, both online and on-site here with us in Katowice at the IGF 2021. My name is Anna, and I'm Director of International Cooperation of the Polish Patent Office, and I will co-moderate this event today, together with Rafael, who is remote. Before we start, we would like to show you a short video that would highlight the main theme of our session. So please watch the video and enjoy. Thank you, Anna, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rafael, and I work at the Corporate Law Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization. Um, please may allow me to, to start by thanking those that contributed to the creation of this video you have just seen. So it's uh, Arvis Games, CD Project Red, Coconut Games, Coated Games, Dossieri, Mayadam, Group Stacks, Technology Development, Zone, Bilsin, Vadiz, Vadizi, third patent and Veloxia. So today together, <clears throat> we'll be guiding you through this workshop on video games and their unity power. Everything you need to know about regulation and new trends. For those fo following this event remotely as I am, please note that we we'll welcome your questions through the chat. I'll read your questions to our speakers with the assistance of my colleagues, Richard Frelick and Victor Wadi. Uh, that not only are monitoring the chat to send me your questions, but as well we're responsible for the co-organization of this event. So thank you uh, to my both colleagues. And please also allow me to take the opportunity and thank uh, my co-moderator Anna and the uh, Polish Patent Office for the excellent and smooth partnership with WIPO in this event and uh, in other topics. So Anna, back to you. 
Thank you so much, Raphael. Also, thank you for the great cooperation with WIPO. Before we move to the main part of our workshop, please let me introduce our special guest, Madame Edita Dembisiewek, the president of the Polish Patent Office, who will just say a few words. President, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. I'm really excited to start this workshop. Uh, I think the last game I played was Tetris. And like Tetris blocks, I would like this workshop to show how all the different intellectual property rights fit together in supporting a vibrant video game industry. When I think about video games, it is not just play anymore. The technology is in the place to go well beyond the limits that we previously seen. Interconnected mechanical system, plot, technology, audiovisual elements, source code, etc. The question is, can it all be protected or rather should it be protect. Having said that, there is a clear need for a discussion on video games. The IGF 2021 is the best opportunity for this exchange. Use the chance for active discussion with international experts uh, of the IP and the sector of video gaming. I wish you all satisfaction and stimulation this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, President. That was very inspiring, and I think playing Tetris will never be the same. With this excellent introduction, uh, let's just move to the main part of our workshop, reminding all the participants that were either physically present or um, participating remotely that they can actively participate in our discussion. So after each session, uh, we will take as many questions as possible, provided we still have some time. And if you'd like to ask a question here on site, please raise your hand and then we will give you the floor. Online, we will also use the Mentimeter tool uh, with some open and quiz questions so you can engage more into our discussion and even have some fun. Uh, the details you will see in the chat box. And at the end, you'll also see the leaderboards um, with the winner of our quiz competition. So uh, let's move, because we have a lot of interesting panelists, and let's move to the main part, to the first topic of our workshop. The video game industry has boomed in recent years because of a variety of ways to play games. This is thanks to digital copy game sales, mobile games, cross-platform games, streaming game services, and so on. The COVID-19 pandemic has also propelled the industry to make more money than movies and North American sports combined. Poland has also proven to be a booming hub for the gaming industry. Because of the success of certain games and events, a lot of independent game developer companies have sprung up. Mobile games generated 274 million US dollars in revenue in Poland in 2020, making it the largest segment of digital video games that year. So now let me introduce our first speaker, Ms. Andrea medvedovici per the Vice President of European Game Developers Federation, streaming online straight from Bucharest. Andrea, we can see that the market is growing and growing. Do you think it will always be like that? And will the video game industry continue to rise? Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. I hope I'll uh, set the scene for uh, this uh, very interesting panel on uh, the video games industry by uh, presenting a few um, informations and a few facts and data about uh, this amazing industry that I'm so proud to be a part of. First of all, I just want to, uh, to let you know that um, I am uh, representing the European Game Developers Federation. I'm the vice president of EGDF. And the Federation is representing 19 trade associations of game developers around Europe and over 2,000 studios developing games, mostly uh, SMEs, but, uh, but not only. Uh, to set the scene, um, I would just like to, to make a point in the fact that um, the video games market is um, 
is now forecasted to be in 2021 a 176 billion dollar market so that's huge taking in also into account that according to new zoo by 2024 it will reach over 215 billion it's more than music and cinema combined and not only um, now during the pandemic, but also before that. So it is obviously um, the um, biggest um, uh, contribution to the entertainment market in, in the world. For example, in the UK alone, it's more than half of its entire entertainment market in 2019, so before the pandemic. pandemic. So will it continue to grow? Obviously, yes. Why will it continue to grow? Because it reinvents itself over and over again talking about reinventation i wanted to mention since you you um you uh, mentioned uh, there uh, about tetris uh, actually a romanian studio amber studio in romania a few months ago just created um another mobile game based on tetris it's called tetris beat so talking about reinventation which i think you guys should uh, should try it out if tetris was the last game that you <laughs> you tried out so it definitely yes uh, it's uh, reinventing itself it's so innovative it's going to grow and it's not going to grow alone i think this is something very important to mention the fact that it's not going to grow alone because because of its innovative power it actually drives and enables digital growth throughout the sector throughout everything that's uh, that's digital internet and everything else so because of new business models that it creates because of innovative technologies that it first um, it creates but also adapts and also tests out in uh, in virtual environments because of business models because of new innovative breaking artistic content all these things will not only help the industry grow but it will also help other industries to grow with it so i think that's uh, very important to know uh talking about europe because we we also need to uh, to see what uh, what's going on here in our um on our turf let's say um i just want to to let you know that uh, we have over um i think uh, around 5000 game developer studios and uh, around 200 game developers with almost 90,000 people employed in the sector. So that's huge. That's a lot of game developers and game publishers um, sparkling from uh, big world giants like Ubisoft. Uh, I know we have a, a panelist from, from Ubisoft here as well. Uh, big giants to very small studios. All of them though, from the smallest to the biggest, creating original IP and making this beautiful world a more creative and a more uh, entertaining uh, entertaining place um all these people uh, working in this in the sector in europe obviously um create games annually when we talk about how many games um, are created in um, in uh, in europe annually uh, we can um, obviously look at around uh, a few thousand games created um, and this uh, obviously means original IP um, or um, franchises or very different uh, type of entertainment that uh, the developers in Romania and uh, Europe uh, uh, of course um, are creating. Um, the market in terms of how much the local game developers um, actually uh, bring in revenue um, the market in Europe is uh, 12 billion euros joining the European budget by local game developers, pub local game developers publishing these uh, few thousand um, games uh, per year. And um, I think uh, I think that's relevant, but also it's relevant to mention that um, although um, they're obviously very concentrated as in many other industries. So the bulk of the revenue coming from uh, some very big actors, uh, that uh, does not mean that uh, the importance of uh, those games uh, created that generate not so much revenue as, um, as others, um, that the, their importance is less because no, they create IP, they create very complex IP, they create uh, worlds and, uh, um, 
artistry and entertainment for a lot of people, and that's uh, obviously uh, hugely and very important. Also, what um, uh, I would like to definitely mention is that it's the actually the only creative sector that turned out to be pandemic resistant in terms of revenue. With everything from visual arts to books to music to architecture, seeing a steep decline in revenue in, uh, in 2020, the only one and the single one that uh, actually show, uh, showed an increase, a 9% increase according to Ernst & Young report, was uh, the gaming sector. And I don't want to change the subject before actually mentioning that the impact games also had in helping the other creative sectors in this time of need. And I think this is going to be a trend that we, we saw accelerated now in, uh, in the pandemic, but we'll see it in the future as well. So many creative sectors needed a home, a shelter, and video games turned out to be just that. For example, you have entire museum collections that moved in game so that they uh, can actually be seen by people play by thousands, millions of people playing games with huge concerts taking place in game and obviously more, more of this type of interactions. So you obviously see again the video game sector as a leader and as, um, as, um, as a sector that enables other creative sectors as well. It was also obviously, since uh, we have a theme here of uh, video games uniting, it was a uniting factor in the pandemic for people around the world which were stuck at home and they were in need for fun, but also for socializing and for interaction with others. And um, the video game sector could, could really do that. So um, again, to just uh, quickly mention that um, apart from its record revenue data, which is obviously important, uh, what's important is that um, the industry is helping create um, complex IP locally, because uh, a game needs uh, needs great artists, for example, it also needs great music. It needs great stories. It needs a lot of a lot of um, combinations of of different um, um, creative people and of different people creating different IP, which creates um, um, an even more complex IP, which is the game itself. Um, I think uh, this um, this influence is very important. In terms of uh, how it will continue to grow, this uh, this amazing industry of ours, um, obviously, I would like to mention the fact that um, an amazing growth was um, in the past, and I'm sure that in the future as well, is led by the fact of um, and the popularity of the mobile game sector. And I think this is important to mention, obviously, because obviously I think because of the ease of checking out your mobile and playing a, a, a very short game, I think mobile games have made everyone in this world a gamer, or definitely if it's not, they're not a gamer, it's a potential gamer. So obviously the growing, um, the sector will grow a lot. Um, what's important is also to know that due to this, these new engines that are created, uh, it's um, making it easier every day to create games. And this is, uh, this is very important and relevant. And once again, the innovative power and the innovation that, uh, that the gaming sector um, leads and uh, that it breeds new innovation into other things. I would like to conclude by saying it can also challenge and actually change the way we look at IP. Since it cha changed and challenged a lot of things before, um, it can also change and challenge the way we look at IP. Knowing it is so complex, um, it's original content, uh, it's also um, content uh, taken from other things, it's also engines which are used for the same, it's parts of code that are used on other different things. It's very similar games together. It's a lot of things that, um, that make the relevance of a, a huge discussion on what IP means for games and what it can, it can do to, um, to, to make it even more relevant, right? In, uh, in this uh, ever-changing world and in this world where games and um, IP is created now um, so much more than ever before, but also in this ever-connecting world, which obviously um, can uh, share IP 
with one click all over the world. So I think that's very, very relevant. Do I still have uh, one more minute or I went through it? I have one more minute. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Okay, cool. Because um, this is something I've I've painted a very nice picture of the of the video game sector. But um, I also uh, would like to mention uh, a few of the challenges that we have uh, globally, but also uh, also here in Europe. And I think that are very very important to 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 mention. So um, what we need for Europe to be even more competitive in this industry and for Europe to create even more IP and even more value in this, uh, in this amazing industry of ours um, are a couple of things. All of them are collect, um, connected to something which is called access. So we need access. First of all, access to data. This is a huge discussion that we're having in very different other parts of um, of, uh, of the um, uh, public um, uh, public debate. Um, access to talent, I think that's very, very important. So um, educating the next um, um, game developers generation is, uh, is very important. We need what, what keeps us from uh, actually becoming, growing even bigger is obviously the talent pool that is not yet ready to um, to help us develop even more games and that this means that educational tools need to be created for uh, the talent pool to rise um, in uh, in the sense that we that we actually need seeing by the number of gamers that are interested to 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 play games um, obviously there's also a thing um, that needs to be discussed is access to funding. There's a lot of money in the industry. Nevertheless, um, there's also a lot of lack of money for the small entrepreneurs in this industry. So for the small studios, access to funding is still very hard to, um, um, to grasp. And I think that's very, very relevant because the video games industry being so innovative and being so um, we obviously being a creative sector itself as well, it's very, very risky in terms of um, in terms of the revenue that you get. And in order for us to have more uh, creative and original IP uh, created in Europe, we need more small and independent studios to be able to create games, to survive creating games. And this obviously means access to funding as well. There's Creative Europe, which obviously um, is a is a, is a help to to towards our uh, industry at the European level, but um, at the state level, uh, the I think each state and the authorities in each country um, in Europe should understand the potential this amazing industry has in order to um, help it grow even better. There are countries in Europe and our hosting country, <laughs> Poland is uh, such an example. There are countries in Europe that um, have uh, already understood that and um, that's uh, creating um, great value for, uh, for the studios and the, the, the development studios in, in those regions. But I think more countries in Europe uh, should understand the potential and help create more, uh, more games in, in their countries and uh, be a part of the success that uh, this industry is globally and as a whole. I think it's, uh, it's very important. Obviously also access to markets. So this is, um, in a way, um, to 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 conclude um, a bit of uh, setting the scene for for what the the video games uh, industry is. Um, um, a hugely um, important um, sector for the creative sector, but also for the digital sector, because uh, through its in innovations, it uh, it drives growth in everything in everything that uh, that it does and it touches. And um, obviously also um, a creator of amazingly original IP. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was a, a great uh, start to our event. You mentioned very important things that I'm sure uh, are going to be mentioned again. So uh, 
uh, moving directly to our second topic that uh, is focused on intellectual property, namely the circle of IP, how IP is created and shared in video games. We'll be discussing different types of uh, IP that are relevant for the different players of this bo booming industry. As mentioned in our introductory video, the different protection offered by IP, such as copyright, trademark, designs, and patents, play an important role in this industry. We're going to hear some first-hand deti details about it. So starting with our first speaker is Ms. Deborah Payani, who is the Senior Vice President of New Business and Strategic Alliances at Ubisoft that I hope that everybody heard about. So uh, without further delay, Deborah, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. So it's, it's not always easy to know when a game becomes an IP, but I guess we all agree that it all starts with an excellent gameplay. And I'd like to give you some examples of IP creation within Ubisoft's creative teams. Rayman was first launched in 95, along with the PlayStation. And after very successful iterations over 20 years, we developed a Rayman game for the launch of the Wii in 2006. In that game, we needed enemies for Rayman, and that's how the rabbits were born. A couple of years later, the rabbits had a game of their own, and they became a brand that quickly outperformed Rayman as an IP, to the point that they're now associated with one of the most respected brands of the industry in Mario Rabbids games. Now, within the Rabbids Great Party game released in 2008 on the Wii, the mini game that was most played was a very simple dance game. And after the release, a couple Ubisoft creatives suggested to turn this mini game into a full game, adding motion captured real dancers. And a year later, the massively successful Just Dance IP was created. So here you can see how the rabbits that were born under the wings of Rayman became an IP of their own and how Just Dance that was born as a mini game of the rabbits became one of the most recognizable video games brand. So for me, more than the process, I'd say IP creation is really a bottom-up journey. It really comes from the team. It's a bottom-up journey with many routes to explore. And I, give you, I could give you many other examples, ranging from Assassin's Creed to Watch Dogs, Splinter Cell, The Division, Far Cry, Roll Allow, or many, many others. Now, how to, to continue to create IPs? Once you have them, maybe you just want to nurture them. Well, at Ubisoft, I guess we maintain a very strong entrepreneurial spirit. Maybe that's because we've always been a challenger. We continue to take risks and we create new games and brands all the time. One significant example is our capacity to embrace the creative opportunities of every new piece of hardware or software. We're always present at the launch of every new platform, console, VR, cloud, blockchain, even if we know that the market might be too small at the very beginning. But new technologies are a great way to invent new gameplays and launch new brands. Now, along with our own original IPs, we also work on epic licensed franchises like Avatar or Star Wars. This mix of internal IPs and uh, IPs from movies or other places enables us to reach wider audiences and also to attract top talents which you just mentioned is key to our industry. And we do that by offering a true playground of games to work on. Now, the only route to success in games is excellence. And to grow our video games into brands and worldwide brands, just because we have no choice, there's no such thing as a local brand almost in games, the first focus needs to be on developing great games. Now, what happens next? Once a game is a brand, we can then find new ways to engage players and even go beyond gamers. A great way to engage players is esports. And Rainbow Six Siege, for example, was played by more than 75 million gamers. 
and now has more than 40 professional teams competing in Europe, North America, Latin America, and the Asia Pacific. And today, video games viewership is increasing way beyond gamers. We also develop content to deep diver, dive, to, to deep deeper, um, to dive deeper into the worlds we create and to reach wider audiences. So we're active in publishing with books, comics, board games, active in licensing with figurines, plushes, lifestyle. We also develop location-based entertainment experiences with escape games, attractions, entertainment centers, and of course, films. For instance, we partners with Netflix to create Assassin's Creed live action, animated and anime series that can appeal to wide audiences. I'd say our brands are global and very rich, both in terms of narrative and in terms of depth. They're in a great position to inspire all types of industry. Without that get a, a lot of attention from other sectors to be associated with our IPs. I just mentioned Netflix, but in addition to featuring our original IPs on Netflix, we're also bringing their franchises into our game. For example, we've created a special in-game event such as La Casa de Papel in Rainbow Six Siege. Music is also very interested in our games and the UK rap artist Stormzy, for example, was a playable character in Watchdog Legion with his own missions and his rainfall music video was made in game. Consumer brands as well. So we're, we can include them into our games when it makes sense with the respective DNA of the game and of the consumer brand. An example this fall, a new khaki field Hamilton luxury watch was launched simultaneously in Far Cry 6 and in real life. And there are many examples. Of course, I'm giving you examples from Ubisoft there, but you, you've heard about big, big examples uh, all over the world. So you also said it, beyond pure entertainment, uh, the video games industry is the first cultural industry in the world. Our reach is enormous because we speak to all, whatever their gender, their age, their culture, or their social position. And yes, mobile played a good part in, in this uh, growth. It took a bit of time, but we're definitely recognized today as a cultural industry. And we actually continue to strengthen our position in the field of traditional culture. We're active in education. For example, with the Assassin's Creed Discovery Tours, the educational mode derived from the Assassin's Creed game that let you explore ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, or the Viking Age. We also have Rabbit's Coding that teaches kids the basic of programming. We work more and more with heritage, monuments, and museums. For example, after the fire of Notre Dame, I asked my team to develop a virtual reality visit of the cathedral based on the 3D model of Notre Dame initially developed for the, game, for the game Assassin's Creed Unity. We also augment the visit of monuments to increase the engagement of the visitors. For instance, we have an augmented reality Assassin's Creed theme escape game at the Invalide in Paris. And last September, the rabbits invaded the gardens of the Chateau de Versailles with a fun educational mini games in augmented reality. We also develop live shows. We do symphony concert, we even turn Just Dance into a live show. And again, when you go all these routes, you have to be very careful to respect the DNA of the game brand. We also contribute to documentary. Lady Sapiens, the scientific documentary recently broadcasted on France Television and PBS with great success, sheds new light on the role of women during prehistory. And it was illustrated by more than 15 minutes of Far Cry Primal in-game videos. That's a scientific documentary. We even work with the health sector. We develop a rabbit game for a connected toothbrush, and we're currently working with Novartis to treat the lazy eye disease. And of course, beyond brands, video game tools and expertise are used outside of our industry, like our real-time engine or our capacity to engage players in all types of activities. 
So as a conclusion, I'd say the video games consumers are among the most engaged, the most demanding, and the most vocal consumers of all industries. We have no choice but to thrive on excellence. Our job's not easy. These video game projects are huge and complex, but we're extremely lucky to be working in the entertainment industry and to have teams that are driven by the same passion. And even the video that you showed just before, and that talks about IPs and trademarks, which is not a fun subject. Well, your video is fun, it looks good and it's nice, also because it's linked to game and entertainment. Our worlds have become a destination for well-known brands and franchises, which also help build additional excitement and buzz in our gaming communities. And this acts like a positive feedback loop that contributes to grow our IPs more and more. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deborah, for these fascinating insights. Uh, we'll now move to our two speakers uh, who are actually with us here on site. And afterwards, we will uh, take up some questions. Uh, right now, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Anna Pihovka, Senior Legal Counsel of CD Projekt Red. Anna has also published a recent article in the WIPO magazine on video games, when video games meet IP law available on WIPO.int. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so I'd like to start uh, by saying that uh, with all my heart, really, I agree that the importance of intellectual property to the whole game industry cannot be overestimated. IP is the heart, soul, and spine of each video game, and it is also games company most valuable asset. Uh, as a result, also intellectual property law is very important, and it should be one of the main reasons of uh, main areas of consideration for each developer and for each other entity on the market, basically. Since I'm working in the development and publishing company as an attorney responsible for IP protection, I'd like to offer you some of my thoughts on legal aspects of creation and sharing of intellectual property. Uh, so to start with, uh, it is uh, of great importance for each game developer to ensure that its IP is legally protected and to build an effective IP protection strategy. Um, as already mentioned several times here, I believe um, the game and almost all its elements are intellectual property. And not all of them are, however, protected without the need of going through the formal registration process. And usually the only IP right which is acquired by a developer or his employees just because, because of the mere creation are copyrights. Uh, luckily to the whole game industry, I would say this is uh, the most important uh, IP right when it comes to protection of uh, video games, uh, since it covers uh, the broadest scope of uh, video games elements, uh, such as, uh, as you saw in the videos, like software or uh, music, uh, visuals and many, many more. Uh, basically, all other IP rights, uh, in order to be protected, uh, in most cases, should be registered. Uh, this is the case, for example, with trademarks, which, as mentioned, can protect the uh, name of the title of the game or logo of the game, or even less obvious things like characters, names, or uh, even looks. Uh, the same applies to patents, uh, which in turn can be used to protect uh, innovative, innovative and uh, technical elements of games like certain algorithms or software. And each registration is always dependent upon fulfillment of uh, specific requirements, payment of fee, and each is territorial. That leads to the fact that um, the challenge ahead of each developer uh, is always to first identify which elements of the game's IP are the most valuable, uh, which IP rights are the most suitable to protect that IP, they as that IP uh, which countries are the most important territories for protection, and then to obtain the strongest possible protection given available budget, time, and needs. And uh, then when IP is already 
created and IP rights uh, are in place, I mean, <laughs> acquired by the developer, uh, the developer can start to share it to different entities. Legally speaking, uh, sharing IP will always have either a form of rights transfer or a license. And to put it very simply, uh, transferring rights um, changes the ownership of it uh, permanently, uh, while licensing uh, means that uh, you just give someone else consent to use your IP while retaining ownership of it. Uh, so unless the developer wants to just give up, uh, to sell the rights to a video game and forget about it, it will go for the licensing. And there are many different licenses out there in the video game market. Uh, some of them are just bases to uh, launch the game and offer it to consumers. Uh, like for example, when a development company is working with an outside publisher, it will start with uh, concluding a license uh, with publisher and give it, uh, give it the rights uh, to publish the game. Uh, the publisher will typically uh, conclude many licenses with many different entities on the market, uh, like console manufacturers or digital platforms or even manufacturers of physical copies of the game. Um, other licenses uh, can serve purposes like promotion of the game, uh, strengthening the value of IP or even building the franchise. So uh, these are things like, uh, for example, mentioned by Deborah <laughs> before, um, we have IP sharing, uh, sharing agreements, uh, we have experiences and many, many other um, examples of uh, how IP can circulate between different entities on the market. What I believe is particularly important is how game companies can use their IP uh, to interact with the players and to build strong communities around their games. Um, first of all, uh, from legal perspective, when a player buys video game, in really reality, he or she uh, just obtains a license to use it. And in its most basic form, uh, such basis, such license uh, will just um, include a consent for using games IP uh, for the purpose of playing the game. Um, however, sometimes um, game companies um, are deciding to give their players uh, some additional licenses in order to further interact with them. And uh, those licenses uh, can, for example, enable players to create and share fun content. And um, the most popular types of fun content, I believe, are streaming and let's play videos, which show the playthrough of the game. But there are many, many more like uh, drawings, paintings, I don't know, cosplay clothing and cosplay and even game modifications. Um, there are always obviously some terms of sharing um, fun content, which can be more or less strict. And uh, probably the most common term is uh, usually a non-commercial use. Uh, sometimes um, the development company or another game company is also asking uh, players to give it a reverse license uh, in order to be able to endorse fun content or even to use it in their future creations. And uh, this is uh, like the mutual license between the company and the player. Uh, there are also other mutual licenses and other interactions, uh, like for example, in case of user-generated content, uh, which is called UGC. And it is um, any form of a player's own addition to the game, uh, like building his own maps or buildings or anything else, which can or cannot be visible to other players depending on the game. Uh, the possibilities of creating and sharing it will differ significantly from title to title, but the common element uh, is that the user-generated content always uh, requires license from the company to the player and from, from player to the company, since UGC uh, just becomes part, 
part of the game. And uh, to end this very short presentation, or I hope at least it was short, <laughs> uh, I would like uh, to emphasize one thing in particular. Uh, when we talk with, about IP and licensing in the video game, we usually think about uh, how IP just serves the purposes of uh, video games companies and is used to um, just uh, gain revenue on uh, selling video games. But in reality, uh, it serves so much more purposes, like, uh, for example, strengthening or being, building the bond between players themselves or between uh, the players and company and building whole communities of the players of uh, certain games. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I wish we had more time for further discussion, but unfortunately, we are on very tight schedule. So let's move straight to our third speaker of this topic, uh, Ms. Masha Stolbova, Head of Legal of Natush Vintere, straight from Kiev, here with us in Katowice. Masha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here, just a couple of steps away from a very remarkable place for Navi, where our CSGO team took several trophies. So I will be talking today about IP Circle in esports. Uh, it is the sphere that is for sure close, but still it goes a little bit beyond the video game. Sorry, if I can jump in, because I think uh, uh, Masha is under muted, or am I the only one not hearing her? I have the same issue. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, now it's okay. Now it's good, Masha. Okay, I'm sorry. sorry. Just briefly repeating the beginning for everyone that missed it. So. Um, I will talk today about the IP of esports organization that a little bit goes outside uh, the video game industry, but still is really close. So in esports organization, it starts from two basic sources. The first one is the organization itself. And the second one is the intellectual property of the players. Uh, as an organization, Navi holds the trademarks in various jurisdictions, various classes. And generally, we hold the trademarks in such spheres as advertising, uh, programming, computer games, um, so marketing, entertainment, and so on. But meanwhile, you can find that in Ukraine, Navi has the trademark for restaurants and bars. And for sure, this is not the mistake. Uh, and of course, Navi has a lot of items that are covered by the copyright protection. For instance, now we are in the process of copyright registration in the United States. But the most interesting part of our today discussion is the intellectual property of uh, the team players. Were we the US, the UK, or the Europe-based organization, we would likely deal with the uh, agents. Frankly speaking, the sentence starts going to the CIS as well. Uh, why do I mention agents? Uh, first of all, because uh, they significantly change the way of management of IP by of the players. And actually, they guide the organizations in this. But frank, but luckily or not, Navi has no, not that many agents and we ourselves manage intellectual property of almost 100 players and coaches. Which IP do we get from the players? We get the name and most important for the game's nicknames, we get the image, the appearance, we get biographic data, voice, and we get the right to use different derivatives hereof and modify that. What we do next with intellectual property? I would not tell you the secret, but sports is really closely linked to video games. So uh, now we talk not only about the PC games, pretty common thing, but already about mobile games. And we have mentioned about mobile games a lot, just on our side, uh, seven out of 15 disciplines that we have now are mobile games comparing to one discipline back in 2020. You might think that it is not too serious for sports and you will be here like-minded with our old fans that are used to Dota and CSGO. Uh, but just let me give you one example why it's really serious. Uh, 
Just one week ago, as champions of Blast Fall competition in CSGO, we got a prize payment in the amount of $125,000. And as runner-ups of Bravo Stars Game World Finals, we got $200,000. Isn't not serious, right? Here we come to the real answer why we strongly need intellectual property in esports. Uh, Anna mentioned really valuable points about building community and so on. But first point for, of course, the business is generating revenue. Let me briefly guide you through the four existing models that we have in sports, uh, by means of which we cooperate with game developers and publishers and respectively receive revenue. The first uh, model is the promotion of the game by Navi players. This was briefly mentioned by Deborah and Anna. So what we do, we get um, the cooperation agreement and license agreement with particular uh, game developers, for example, Ubisoft, and our players prepare the special content and they advertise the game. Sometimes uh, we need to publish this content not only on the pages of Navi, but we go to the uh, personal pages of the players and sometimes there is so much request for such content that we need to take separate people, uh, the streamers, just to, to ask them not, not to play for us in, during the tournaments, but just to create the content itself. Uh, there are maybe two core IP implications that we have here. The first one is uh, maybe like the less top on this core one. There are some uh, game developers that want to get everything at once. I mean here that they want to have unrestricted rights for this intellectual property created. Uh, is it a problem for us? Of course it may be, because when your license is sublicensable, uh, perpetual, there is no limitation as to the purpose of its use, territory, yada, yada, yada. You can find at one moment your trademark used in very unexpected places. Uh, the second way of our communication with the game developers is in-game items. Uh, there are very, various types of such in-game items and game objects that have the intellectual property of organization or, for example, as in CSGO, the signatures of the players. Uh, users can buy them and use instead of default items, game items. They generally do not grant any specific game advantage, uh, as in our cases. So they are like the in-game cosmetics. Uh, it all started really well in back in 2014, 15, then faded a little bit, but now COVID boosted the purchases so much that it seems like we're secured in this phase. Uh, one of the challenges that may be here is the repeal of uh, these items in a certain time. For instance, if the team wants to terminate the agreement, what happens to the not purchase items? Uh, what is the sell-off period if there is such sell-off period and how long can the end users actually use these items? And the second challenge is trading on the second market. Is it allowed at all? Is it possible? Do the teams get revenue from secondary trading market? Uh, so these are the basic questions here. The third model is integration of the player in the game. Just a week ago, we announced that Simple, Alexander Kostelev, the best world CSGO player, becomes the uh, character of Rage Shadow Legends cooperation. Uh, he is literally turned into 3D model and just inserted in the game. So you can buy this uh, um, in-game item now in Rage Shadow Legends. We had really too many questions around this deal and majorly they were around intellectual property because what will be with all this stuff when the in just in case the partnership ends uh, we have this deal right now we are very lucky to have such complicated cases and we'll see how it works and the final one is nft integrations kindly mentioned by deborah just briefly so we are now planning to have it uh, in a couple weeks uh, the one game will release and we will see how one more integration works for us. So I think that I'm a little bit run of time. So uh, yes, we could speak about this topic forever because there is no sphere, we do not use IP. I will be glad to answer your questions and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Masha, and sorry for rushing you, but really we may not have the time and we still want to give the floor to our participants here on site. Are there any questions? If you could just uh, please go to the main table because then you need microphone. And yes, um, I think you gentlemen, you were first, so please go ahead. 
So the sound is okay. So first of all, thank you to all speakers for your discussion. My question is related to video games, but a little bit related to something else as well. Uh, so the question is mostly about creating the narratives through video games. And I will just give you two examples what I mean. The first one is about the game from Ubisoft. Well, Assassin's Creed was mentioned several times and uh, the representative of Ubisoft said that, okay, there was a creation of Notre Dame uh, Cathedral, but I also remember creation of historical figures. For instance, while playing the game, I had a chance to interact with Nicola Machiavelli or uh, Medici and Richard. And the point is that the way I saw them in the game impacted my perception of historical figure as well. But this is a more neutral example. Another example I have is more modern and more political. So after Russo-Georgian War in 2008, Russian developers created the strategy game, which was in like 100% in accordance with Russian propaganda view of the war. So even if we had the look on the wallpaper of the game, there was the cartoon of president of Georgia, Saagashvili, and the way it was looking, it was mocking him. And also if we go to the storyline of the game, it was 100% in accordance with this nonsense Russian narrative of the war, putting blame on Georgia and Western allies for waging the war. So to wrap up my question, my question is, is there any kind of relevant and serious debate about video games as being used of propaganda or this is not the case yet and this debate isn't relevant in video game industry? Thank you. Okay, I would just like to ask whether one of our speakers would like to take up the questions. Anyone online, maybe? Can you, Anna? Okay. Ah, yes, so just uh, very briefly, because uh, I think the question is uh, very deep and uh, we do not have uh, uh, time to discuss it maybe in detail, which um, it should be answered. Uh, but uh, yes, there is uh, like starting discussion about this, also about uh, many other uh, new aspects, I would say, of video games, because uh, uh, the um, uh, market of video games is booming, and the more is it booming, the new uh, like problems and issues uh, are discovered. And um, yeah, in recent years, uh, the discussion about uh, also political messages in video games and uh, I would say many other aspects uh, uh, has started. But uh, at the same time, I will say that uh, the area is uh, very new and um, we'll have to see how, how, it, how it goes in the future. Thank you so much, Anna. It was indeed a difficult question, so thank you so much for the answer. I know we have two more questions, but we are really tight on schedule, so if you could just uh, uh, give your questions and just be very brief so we can try to answer. So maybe you, sir, please go first. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers, and my question would be for the Ubisoft representative, the representative sorry, from the RPG Codex um, Forum. Uh, there were some of the uh, interesting things that you said uh, in your in your speech, and one of them especially caught my eye that you underlined that the company continues to take risks. And I would like to ask, what risks exactly are we talking about? Because as far as uh, I'm concerned, uh, Ubisoft and Bethesda basically turned themselves into the Marvel studio of the gaming industry. And if there is two, there are two companies who don't do uh, anything that involves risks that your company and Bethesda, you just uh, create a product that is accessible to anybody, and provides a minimum level of challenge and so on. Do you think you are like uh, pushing, uh, you are the impetus towards dividing the game, uh, game industry world between the cinema, as Martin Scorsese would have put it, and between art house? Uh, what I, thanks for your question. What I meant by taking risk is the fact we don't just nurture our big IPs and stay there. We try new things all the time. And we go, um, we go to routes that uh, we haven't explored before. I'll give you an example. We launched 
Hyperscape, which was a free to play. We hadn't done a big free, done a big free to play before. We released this one. It was not a success. And, and we learned that we went all the way, we released it, we developed it, we released it, we learned and we'll do better next time. But it's not just um, a deriv derivation of Assassin's Creed or Far Cry. It's something different, it's something new. The fact that we were very early on VR, not all the big publishers were early on VR, uh, not all the big publishers support all new technology. Yesterday, we also announced something linked to uh, blockchain and NFT. Uh, so we are very early. And in that, we also take risk. The fact that we are a profitable company doesn't mean that we do not take risk. Um, we, um, we do games that are history based. We do mobile. We do uh, games that are more contemporary. We do things that are more futuristic. So it's a very large span. Um, and also there are plenty, plenty of games that are developed internally and are, are, don't actually reach the market. So this you don't really see because they're never announced, but we take the risk in the sense that our teams are free to propose new concepts all the time and we let them start to develop and then it can go on for three months, six months, maybe two years. And sometimes we kill games because they have no future, but at least we try. So there's a lot of money and resources put in that as well. Continue to innovate. Uh, thank you so much, but sir, I know, uh, is it a short question? <laughs> okay, so just like really, please be brief, so. Okay, perfect. I First of all, I wanna make a comment about uh, this session that I love, it's dominated by women, because in the gaming industry, it's, uh, it's male oriented. Uh, my question is for Anna uh, and uh, the Ubisoft, uh, Ubisoft representative uh, said something about NFTs. I wanna ask about um, specifically small creators, uh, small artistic creators. Um, what do you think about the legality of NFTs and the future of NFTs? Because uh, if you wanna make your IP as a independent artists and go through the whole legal things, it's challenging, but NFTs offers uh, a faster way to uh, making your copyrights. So what are the challenges and legally speaking about, about NFTs? Yes, uh, maybe very briefly, because uh, uh, the fact is uh, the discussion about NFT is now uh, very intense within uh, legal, I, I would say, um, uh, between lawyers, uh, because uh, we still don't know. Uh, so maybe I, I wouldn't say there is any um, concern about legality, but the aspects of uh, virtual, purely virtual and NFTs uh, are still to be determined, determined when it comes, comes, comes to intellectual property and uh, the effects of all of that. So I'm sorry, but I want to be very helpful. Uh, this is uh, like a big uh, topic and still discussed uh, by lawyers themselves. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anna. And I think we'll be talking about NFTs during our uh, next, the final topic. So I, I can see you still have some questions, but maybe we can answer them at the last session when we still have some time. So please let me introduce right now our third topic on the main challenges for the future, actually. So I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Andres Guadamus, the senior lecturer in IP law from the University of Sussex. And without further delay, Andres, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks for the uh, to the organizers for the kind invitation uh, to this panel. This is uh, truly uh, an honor to be in uh, this company. Um, I have to start with a very quick disclaimer. Um, I am just an academic who has been writing on the interface between uh, copyright and technology for many years, but I'm also uh, talking from the perspective of someone who has been a, a, a keen gamer for uh, most of my life. So you can see from the um, uh, uh, gaming chair that I'm uh, talking from, uh, and you can also insert uh, your how do you do fellow kids meme here. Uh, uh, but uh, I am also, uh, so I'm talking from a perspective on industry outsider, but also someone who is very keen on looking at the industry from a policy perspective, particularly talking about the interface between games 
and IntelliCore property. As we've heard from the previous panel, uh, this is a very exciting time for the games industry. Uh, it was one of the creative industries that actually not only managed to weather the pandemic, uh, but also uh, managed to thrive as well. This means that the present and future of the industry look very bright and look like, very healthy. Uh, I would like, so I would like to comment on a few trends uh, that we can see, perhaps from a more cautious uh, perspective and an outsider perspective as well, um, that with the understanding that these are uh, from a friendly outsider. Uh, the first opportunity that I want to talk about very briefly is something that has already been mentioned, um, and it's the emergence of the metaverse. Uh, for something that is actually being talked quite a lot in recent months. Uh, the definition of what is uh, the metaverse tends to be quite elusive. Um, depending on how you define it, some old virtual communities uh, from the early days of the, of the web could actually apply uh, or be defined or meet the definition of uh, the metaverse. Things like multi-user dungeons or mods, uh, which were the first virtual environments, even though they were mostly text-based. However, the term metaverse has become uh, um, uh, well, it was uh, coined first, uh, as we know it, by uh, Neil Stevenson's uh, cyberpunk a classic novel, Snow Crash, and it was used to describe an immersive version of the internet that only could be visited with some form of um, virtual reality equ equipment. Over the years, the, real the virtual reality element appears to be very important to what we understand to be as a metaverse. But I really, when we think about it, if we think about some form of immersive uh, environment, uh, most of the most successful implementations of uh, something that could be considered uh, metaverse have been in, vir in virtual world games, uh, things like MMOs, uh, massive multiplayer or online games, things like Ultima Online, RuneScape, City of Heroes, World of Warcraft, Star Wars, The Old Republic, and Elder Scrolls Online, just to mention a few that I've played and spent way too much time in. Uh, however, the metaverse, uh, as we see it, is being presented in sort of the Facebook metaverse, let's call it, um, the new implementation, seems to be a platform-based environment where developers are going to design games that work for a specific development environment be it hardware or software. This view presents the metaverse more like the oasis uh, in Ready Player One, um, where all IP, all of the developers and all of the intellectual property will inhabit in one single space. So the opposite of this vision has to do with some of the things that uh, have been talked about already. It's a vision of a more open and decentralized metaverse with no centralized authority, it will be powered by Web3 tools, but more on that a little bit later. Um, whatever shape the metaverse takes, uh, it is evident that games will continue to be their main application, I think. Um, this brings me to the second opportunity and challenge. So with the potential to have more prevalent multiverse uh, environment and new business opportunities and a growing user base, there is going to be quite a lot of uh, potentially a call uh, for to make more of the platforms interoperable with one another, or if there is going to be a one platform to make it uh, work with different types of intellectual property. So uh, as both as a gamer, as an observer of the policy debates around intellectual property, the interoperability of, uh, of games has been very, very important from an uh, interesting legal perspective arising in this area. From a more uh, strict copyright perspective, it is recognized that interoperability and reverse engineering are permitted. Uh, they're important part of how computer programs are allowed to interact with one another. So we encounter a future where the multiverse platforms become centralized. This question of interoperability is going to be vital. And I think this is uh, one of the biggest challenges. The third opportunity, and uh, uh, because I want to be quite brief, uh, is um, for gaming that is already happening, is that pot uh, the potential 
use of tokenization of in-game assets, and uh, many of the previous speakers have talked about this. Um, this is seen in the shape of non-fungible tokens, the NFTs, uh, and the deployment of the so-called Web3, uh, which uh, in which are apps and platforms powered by blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, there is a lot of hype in this area, so it is important to keep up the potential opportunities and challenges grounded in reality. What I find very interesting from the NFT perspective is that they're being sold as potential marketplaces to develop. Uh, so in some games, there is already the, the use of some form of NFTs in which players can purchase characters for sale. This is the case with uh, Axie Infinity, which uh, is, is sort of proving to be uh, an interesting environment and it has been uh, already developing marketplaces. There are some issues that in order to enter those games, players have to make an investment in advance, um, sometimes massive investments. And there is no assurance that the returns on investment are going to be recuperated. So this is an interesting uh, potential policy uh, avenue to explore, maybe we're going to encounter some uh, some challenges with that. Um, and just, uh, let's see, just to go um, uh, quickly, um, uh, the other uh, potential with tokenization is that uh, there's going to be potential for uh, gamers to, um, uh, to tokenize things like goods, skins, characters in game. This is going to be uh, open in opening exciting opportunities for future interoperability. So you would be buy an item in, or a skin in, in one game, it would be tokenized and then potentially moved to another game. Um, I have no idea if this is ever going to work, but some lots of users are, are abuzz with think, uh, thinking about these opportunities, things that, uh, some consider would be the use case for Web3 apps in gaming. Uh, just to conclude a very brief, uh, a brief uh, remarks, um, uh, users want, as a user with my user hat on, as a gamer hat on, we want all of this amazing you know, innovation to continue, but I will warn against paying too much attention to some of the hype and buzzwords surrounding the space. While the metaverse and NFTs could bring about lots of very interesting and opportunities. Blockchain technology can also uh, be considered sometimes to be expensive and slow down networks, um, which is one of the challenges. So whichever solution is chosen will probably have to be understood in, not as a public blockchain, but probably private blockchains. And I can explain that uh, more uh, later. Um, only time will tell which versions will eventually be deployed. Uh, one thing is for sure, you'll find me in the frontiers of these brave new worlds blasting something with magic. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andres. It was a, a, a great introduction to, to this panel. And let me jump to the, our next speaker, who is uh, Matthew Scato who's a senior corporate counsel at uh, gaming Microsoft. Microsoft that perhaps uh, was responsible for the first uh, video game of many of us, such as Solitaire. So uh, Matt, please take the floor. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today uh, at the IGF. And um, um, I also will be speaking a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities that we focused on both today and sort of looking into the future. Um, I want to say briefly, though, uh, at the start that, um, you know, as we've heard, there is really no area of law that is more pervasive across gaming, and I would say fundamental to its success than intellectual property. Um, at Xbox, uh, the head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, is fond of saying innovation is our only true long-term differentiator. And I really appreciate that sentiment. Um, to me, it underscores the importance of the global IP system to protect innovation and the health and success of uh, this vibrant creative sector. So to those of you in the room and on the call that play a role in the functioning of that system, um, please accept my gratitude for the work that you do keeping um, our IP system robust and effective. Uh, now, uh, shifting to the, the challenges and opportunities of today and tomorrow, I thought it might start to uh, share a little bit about the Xbox uh, vision for gaming uh, at the outset. Uh, Microsoft estimates there are about 4 billion gamers on the planet. At Xbox, our objective is to reach all of these players with compelling experiences that put the player at the center of the experience. 
Our goal is for every gamer on the planet to play the games they want, where they want, with the people they want. And the challenges and opportunities that we focus on are those that really help to advance this vision. Most recently for us, this has meant three challenges. First, continuing to develop new and innovative gaming experiences. Second, finding new compelling offers. And third, new ways to deliver the experiences. And of course, intellectual property rights and considerations are fundamental and pervasive across all of these challenges. Uh, to speak about the first area and uh, just to say a little bit about an example of a new innovative game experience, um, I wanted to say a few words about Microsoft Flight Simulator. Uh, so speaking of a game maybe that was the first for some of us to experience, uh, and some people don't realize this, but Microsoft Flight Simulator is actually older than Microsoft Windows. Um, we, as we know, gamers are a highly demanding, very engaged group of customers. And I, I love that among the teams that I get to work with, we are all gamers. So we bring our high standards and expectations for innovation and, and moving gaming forward to all the projects that we work on. And certainly uh, the most recent version of Flight Simulator has been no exception. Um, a signature of the Flight Simulator series um, uh, through all releases is that each new release has set a new bar for innovation in 3D virtual environments. Uh, this is certainly true for the most recent release and it's really a hallmark of the new release, just how many forms of content are composited together to deliver the experience. For example, Flight Simulator combines satellite imagery from Bing Maps, AI generated buildings, numerous forms of data such as topographical and elevation data from public sources like NASA and others, uh, street maps from open source and community projects and on and on. It also uses the power of Microsoft Azure to deliver air traffic, weather and navigation. The result is the player can fly virtually across the high fidelity digital twin of the planet with graphics that in some cases are indistinguishable from Air, real life aerial photos. Um, and during the pandemic, we've seen this experience bring joy to people in ways that we never expected. Uh, humans are curious. And during a time when travel has been restricted, Flight Simulator has given, them, has given them a means to explore the world right from the convenience of their PC. And of course, this all required a bit of IP work, uh, rights issues with the satellite imagery, with the data, with compliance, with contracts, agreements with aircraft manufacturers. Uh, suffice to say, it's been a lot, but we're, we're super proud of, of the achievement. Uh, shifting to the second topic, um, another challenge is uh, new offers, new offers that, gives, that give gamers a means to play all the content that they want and to discover new games at a really compelling value. Uh, to help satisfy gamers' appetites for content, Microsoft has launched Xbox Game Pass, which is a monthly subscription that provides access to over 100 games. This offer represents a tremendous value considering that the subscription price is often just a fraction of the full purchase price for a single title that might be included in the subscription. And certainly inside Xbox Game Studios, and there, we now have 24 wholly owned studios, um, thousands of engineers, artists, coders, et cetera. Uh, we are tasked with developing and publishing titles to help support Xbox Game Pass. So this includes titles from our game franchises like Minecraft, Halo, Fallout, Forza Motorsport, the Elder, Elder Scrolls series, Sea of Thieves, Gears of War, Age of Empires, and more. And of course, Xbox Game Pass includes games from some of the largest publishers of games for the Xbox platform. Um, but we've committed to launching new titles on a day and date basis in Xbox Game Pass, which means the titles available in the subscription offer on the same day it's available for general commercial release. And we strive to have one new major release to Game Pass per month. And of course, copyright is a fundamental basis for our ability to invest this substantially in, in new content for Xbox Game Pass. We've also brought much of our back catalog, as much of our back catalog as possible to Xbox Game Pass. And offering each new title in, in the subscription generally requires a careful review of the rights and licenses for any third-party content that is included and whether there are any obstacles uh, 
uh, that are posed to including the game in the subscription offer. So this is a known issue and in, in copyright is you know understanding rights and limitations on licenses, but it's one that we, we take seriously and, and navigate with care. Uh, the third area of focus I just wanted to briefly discuss was uh, delivering new gaming experiences. And in particular, I wanted to talk about Project xCloud. Simply put, Project xCloud is a gaming experience powered by an Xbox console in the cloud. The software is executed on a device that sits in a data center while the player is remote. The player can access the service and play supported titles from a variety of supported device types, a mobile or tablet um, a device, a PC or a game console. And the ability to stream supported titles is included in the price of the Xbox Game Pass subscription. And this offers a really compelling gaming experience considering that the service can be accessed from a mobile device. Younger gamers in particular are not just digital natives, they are mobile natives. They're more interested in consuming media on the go. And the service also allows gamers to enjoy all of the games in the subscription offer by bringing their own device. Uh, so it's a, a really compelling solution for gamers that may already have a mobile phone or a tablet, but aren't able necessarily to invest in the cost of a dedicated game console. And so, of course, a Project X Cloud also uh, implicates a number of intellectual property issues. Uh, just as with Xbox Game Pass, when we include a title in Project X Cloud, we do a careful review of the rights and licenses for any third party content. Uh, and certainly for new games uh, that we're developing, anytime uh, we think about including third party content, we are now sure that we obtain sufficient rights to make sure we can offer the title uh, through a streaming uh, service like Project X Cloud. So uh, those are just three areas of, of opportunities and challenges we're focused on. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Matthew. That's a great insight about the, the new advances on streaming and the legal implications of that for, for Microsoft. And uh, without delay, I have the pleasure to also introduce uh, the next speakers of, the, of this topic, who is uh, Mr. Olivier Piacentin, founder of uh, Ikimashu. Uh, Olivier, the floor is yours. I shall speak quickly. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Um, a little background, I've been running a 10% VR game studio in Paris for the past four years. Um, so here are my thoughts on opportunities and challenges for the next years as a game studio owner. That will differ a little from uh, previous persons. Well, you'll still hear the same keywords you already know, uh, hopefully you know, from different angles. Um, one quick note, uh, I started with VR because I saw it as a great business opportunity earlier on. Um, I think Deborah mentioned that new hardware uh, gets you opportunities to establish game designs and IPs early on and start your studio with lower competition marketing barriers. So I came in from a business standpoint rather than just uh, enjoying the games I'm making, which I do, by the way. Um, I'll be talking about Metaverse, uh, user generated content, everything. Um, so let's dive into Metaverse first. Any tech or game company wants you more and more online. Um, the tech companies, because they sell ads and statistics, and they need to model your behavior. The game companies, because they build economics around their game systems, and they sell you more content and uh, can also uh, bring you on a subscription base for the services. And Metaverse being the promise of the ultimate always online experience, um, that's why it seems bound to happen for those companies and for us customers. Um, it will either look like giant games building on many gameplay systems that will add to each other, or on the other hand, what was called the Meta Metaverse, now it's called Facebook, um, kind of airport-like hubs where you shop and either around, chat with friends and enjoy, enjoy speaking about things instead of doing activities. And for companies like mine, that means that I can either build games that uh, add to these existing hubs or systems, uh, or I can, even, I can even dream of starting new businesses inside those hubs, akin to the ones in the real world. Uh, for instance, I do believe that VR tourism uh, is going to be a thing in the future. 
um, going from place to place with a friend of yours or main friend of yours. Uh, that's going to be something. Uh, of course, there's the whole thing about giving tools to communities and releasing um, systems that allows users to build content and to expand the world they're working. This is, of course, uh, raising some concerns with uh, IP and fairness toward users that actually contribute to the world. Um, I'll, can, uh, I can direct you to some uh, uh, recent uh, Roblox uh, issues, but they, it's always been the case. Uh, amazing uh, studio uh, used to have some controversy 10 years ago when they started the screenplay competition to turn into films. You can get, a, get an idea with that. Uh, of course, being online anytime in the metaverse for users also applies to people that built the metaverse. A pandemic has shown us that we could work differently and remote is not built in game teams, really. It used to work pretty well. Uh, it's a whole new level now. And, and I believe this could help in terms of job opportunities across the world. Uh, at the same time, the challenge it represents is for onboarding and properly training those new recruits, especially their uh, juniors or uh, fresh out of high school or they are training. Um, so we must balance this uh, fantastic opportunity to get anyone on board across the world to build your products with their training, their careers, and also the perspective of diversity and inclusion that have been um, put as foremost topics in the recent years, especially for publishers in North America, uh, which really want to support studios and show empowerment to their employees. If you are to live in that uh, online life more than you do uh, at the moment, you need to make sure your avatar is remembered by the game, acknowledged by other players, and that these translate across games. Uh, this is something that um, uh, goes a little in the topic of interoperability, which is a technical hurdle first, but it also uh, needs to be addressed from the terms of meaning for users. Like if I'm always online in a FIFA game, how does it translate when I first start a battlefield campaign? Do I have experience? How do I translate that? How do I get meaning across different IPs by remaining the same. NFT and blockchain, of course, might be part of the answer to how you identify, um, but that's only one part of the, of the issue because they represent as many APIs that you need to connect to. And as a game studio, I cannot address all NFTs or all blockchain possibilities that are offered to me. Uh, and I want to watch for the new world, greener, less network plugin solutions that are being currently developed. Idea of who you are in the online system also is very important because at some point, if you create content and if you deliver it and if you sell it, well, you are actually uh, making revenue and you need to be taxed somehow and your online identity has to relate to who you are in the real world, uh, at least for some IP protection and also for your taxation bill. So I believe for all this reason, we, don't, we won't have a, a full metaverse from the beginning. We'll have several metaverses kind of. And Game Studio will attract gamers with the promise of fun. Not everything is possible, but what has been is tailored to be fun. And the big metaverse companies like Meta, or TikTok, Apple maybe, will promise anything is possible and we want everyone to come for free. So on the one hand, you will have carefully uh, curated IPs that are hard to create, so they need to be structured for long-term branding and revenue. On the other end, well, I mean, Meta wants as much Marvel and as Asterix as fresh IPs to drive everyone for free on there. And this balancing of how you drive your IPs uh, across this metaverse and metaverses uh, is something that has to be taken into account. Publishers and game studios like mine uh, face another challenge with IP. Uh, we need to design those properties for multiple exploitations right from the start. 
it's no longer possible to have a hit game, then think about how to turn it into comics, series, board game, theme park rides. Um, I mean, if you think about Disney for a moment, at the top of the entertainment chain, um, the film IPs Disney creates account for less than 30% of the entire revenue, which is as much as the parks and goodies stuff. EA, Ubisoft, Microsoft have the power to become much more powerful to broader licensing of their IPs. And this is a reflection that indie game studios should lead to. Uh, that was maybe a little quick. Uh, there's plenty more to talk about in terms of opportunities. New hardware that is coming out uh, every so often, uh, often too quickly, uh, then uh, your developer can react. Uh, AI, personal assistance, educational games, but also all the business side of things which need to make sure uh, structured financing for bigger projects, co-productions across Europe for financing, but also to team up companies that add to each other's expertise, um, insurance for the stuff you own online, all those kind of things. It's really booming and still amazing how quickly technology evolves and promise a better, more entertaining future. So uh, I'll make sure I'll see you around in the next years with this question. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Olivier. Uh, that was a great uh, presentation. So. Let's move to our last speaker. It's a pleasure uh, to introduce my colleague, Dimitri Ganchev, who is a deputy director and senior manager here at the copyright and creative industry sector. Uh, Dimitri, without delay, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Raphael. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to see this event. Uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, such events are taking place all over the world in different regions. Um, and um, many of you have pointed to the importance of educating developers uh, on what they, they actually have and what kind of income streams they can bring to themselves. And with this in mind, of course, WIPO has a very important educational function. And uh, I wanted to let you know that um, we're coming up with, a, with an updated um, second version of our flagship publication, uh, Mastering the Game, which is coming out uh, next month, um, which is three times bigger than the first one. And uh, it is trying to reflect all of these interesting developments which have taken place uh, in terms of legislative developments, in terms of business models. Uh, what you will find in this publication is a much larger geographical scope. So we are covering, we're trying to cover the different regions. Uh, we're keeping up the practical focus. Uh, it's a tool for, uh, for developers really to find themselves, uh, find their way in the different forms of IP which are available to them. Uh, we also have some new chapters on uh, esports. Uh, we introduce uh, the AI issues, which were not there a few years ago. So, uh, trying to be up to date and to offer you something which will be valuable. So, um, you're all welcome to consult it, and hopefully, you will make use of it. We are uh, using it as a training tool when we organize events around the world, and there is a growing demand for such events from from, from different parts of the world. So we hope it will be something of interest. Raphael, back to you. I know time is pressing. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Indeed, it's a very interesting publication, if I can say that uh, myself uh, as a, a part of your team. So uh, also, of course, WIPO has a number of initiatives on video games. We had uh, a study on the legal status of video games in our comparative analysis a few years ago. We have an interactive infographic on how IP shaped the PlayStation. We have uh, uh, IP clinics and networks for video game develops uh, uh, being planned in, the, in Asia and uh, Eastern European and Baltic state countries. So I would like to thank, of course, uh, all those in WIPO that participate in the different initiatives, uh, Dimitra, my colleague Richard, Felek, uh, Victor Wadi, uh, Virag uh, Hagland, and uh, many, many more. And uh, I also like to uh, thank for the online audience who have a very good number of participants uh, in this uh, uh, workshop. Thank again the, the Polish Patent Office in the person of the president and of course Anna uh, for the great partnership. And please uh, let me pass you back to Anna. Thank you everybody. Thank you so much, Raphael. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to finish, but I hope it is just the beginning of our dialogue on video games and their future. Um, thank you so much to all the 
participants, to all the speakers, to my co-moderator, Rafael, and please see on the screen the winner of our quiz. So congratulations. And I wish you all of you a great day and looking forward to seeing you at our next events. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.